From beginning to end, coronary artery bypass graft surgery, or cabbage, takes about four hours. It begins with a midline sternal incision, and then a bovie, or an electric cautery, is used to cauterize all the small bleeding vessels in the area. With the skin retracted back, the sternum is exposed. The sternum is opened up using a sternal oscillator. During this time, the lungs are not inflated to avoid injury to them. This is a sternal retractor. It allows us to get down to the heart to work on it. It disperses all of the weight of the sternum equally. The pericardium is then exposed. The pericardium is then open, revealing the contractile mechanism of the heart. The pericardium is then pulled back using suture to allow proper exposure. Once the pericardium is open, the first heart chamber that is revealed is the right ventricle. The aorta is palpated for calcification and the ease of placing the bypass cannula. Calcification may cause stroke or distal ischemia. Looking at the surgical field, you should be able to identify the following structures. The right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, the right atrium or right atrial appendage, and the aorta. Cardiopulmonary bypass is commonly used in heart surgery because of the difficulty of operating on the beating heart. Bypass is a technique that temporarily takes over the function of the heart and lungs during surgery, maintaining the circulation of blood and the oxygen content of the body. Any operations requiring the opening of the chambers of the heart require the use of cardiopulmonary bypass to support the circulation during that period. Cardiopulmonary bypass mechanically circulates and oxygenates blood for the body while bypassing the heart and the lungs. It uses a heart and lung machine to maintain perfusion to other body organs and tissues while the surgeon works in a bloodless surgical field. The surgeon places a cannula in the right atrium, vena cava, or femoral vein to withdraw blood from the body. The cannula is connected to tubing filled with isotonic crystalloid solution. Venous blood that is removed from the body by the cannula is filtered, cooled, oxygenated, and then returned to the body. The cannula used to return oxygenated blood is usually inserted in the ascending aorta, but it may be inserted in the femoral artery. The patient is administered heparin to prevent clotting. During the procedure, hyperthermia is maintained. The cooled blood slows the body's basal metabolic rate, decreasing its demand for oxygen. A temperature probe is inserted on the heart, and the heart may be packed with ice, further lowering the temperature and decreasing its metabolic demands. The aorta is cross-clamped to maintain a bloodless field and to allow the bypasses to be connected to the aorta. In addition, the aortic cross clamp allows the perfusionist to deliver cardioplegia, which is a cooled potassium mixture that allows the heart to stop. The cross clamp prevents the solution from entering systemic circulation. We are now ready to attach our grafts. The most common grafts used are the saphenous veins and the internal thoracic arteries, also known as the internal mammary artery. The success of coronary artery bypass grafting is dependent on the long-term patency of the arterial and venous grafts. Worldwide, more than 800,000 patients undergo cabbage annually, with more than 350,000 patients operated each year in the United States. 
Based on small studies of selected groups of patients, it is generally believed that SVGs have a 40 to 50 percent 10 year patency and that the IMA has a 90 to 95 percent 10 year patency. The rewarming period after cardiopulmonary bypass is associated with a decrease in the compliance of the ventricles. The etiology is unclear, but myocardial edema from cooling and reperfusion may play a role. The peripheral vascular resistance can either increase or decrease in the immediate postoperative period. Systolic function is variable, but seems to be well maintained in most patients. The decrease in ventricular compliance during the rewarming period causes a decrease in end diastolic volume at any given end diastolic pressure. This means that a normal wedge pressure in the early postoperative period represents a low end diastolic volume. Therefore, when cardiac output is low and the wedge pressure is not elevated, volume infusion is indicated. We are now ready to come off bypass. As the flows are decreased and the heart is allowed to fill, following Frank Sterling mechanism and allowing the cross-linking of actin and myosin to occur allows the contractile mechanism of the heart to be regained. Protamine is given to reverse the effects of heparin. Usually, epicardial wires are inserted. Epicardial pacing wires were historically placed only on the right ventricle. In this position, they allow ventricular stimulation, which is usually not as mechanically efficient as endogenous depolarization. More importantly, there is no coordinated atrial contraction. Many patients, especially those with reduced ventricular compliance, as occurs in ischemia, have a substantially reduced cardiac output in the absence of atrial contraction. For this reason, pacing wires on the right atrium is often also desirable. Epicardial wires are manufactured with a small needle on one end. This is used to embed the wire in the myocardium, after which the needle is cut off. A larger needle on the other end of the wire is used to penetrate the body wall, bringing the wire to the surface. Although the right ventricle is the most commonly used location, there is no agreement on optimal wire position. Chest tubes are placed in the mediastinum and the pleural space to drain blood from around the heart and lungs. Any excessive drainage from the chest tubes suggests continued bleeding, which may require reoperation to manage. No drainage may suggest an obstructed tube, which may result in cardiac tamponade and or pneumothorax, which may be lethal. The sternum is wired together and the incisions are sutured closed.